Two quick thing. Go ahead. Uh, just real quick about um, CS two forty B. Um, <clears throat> can I can I send you a, I guess, uh, video presentation just for your commentary before I actually submit it? Maybe like next week or something. Oh, you 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 want my feedback? Is this what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, just just your feedback. That's all. Uh, I I will be happy to do that, Cody. Okay, cool. Thanks. So send it to me, and I will be happy to review it. And it's 10 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK. All right. We have a small class today. Uh, so, so this week, we're doing chapter 8. And I want to show you the big picture. And chapter eight is implementing VPNs. And uh, next week we're talking about ASA and uh, we will go over some of the material we're going over this week, next week, because one of the purposes we use an, S an ASA device is to VPN. So we will go over VPNs uh, to next week as well. So let's do a quick review and then let's do the labs. And if you have questions, please do ask. So uh, benefits for VPN, there are lots and lots of benefits for VPN. Uh, by far the biggest benefit is cost savings. Uh, as I said before, the days of uh, leased lines are pretty much over because leased lines are very, very expensive. And now everyone has a massive pipe into the internet and we wanna use that pipe for all kinds of purposes, including connecting sites to sites and connecting remote users to sites. Uh, and that saves uh, the company a lot of money. Uh, security, we, we certainly want to do it securely. Anytime you go over the public internet, you want to make sure security is a top priority. Scalability, uh, that size, that pipe size that connects site A to site B or connects a user to a site depends mostly on how big your pipe to the internet is from both ends. So a company that has uh, a, a gigabit connection to the internet from each of their four different sites can have a very large VPN pipe. And companies that have a 100 megabit connection to the internet are gonna end up having a smaller uh, VPN pipe size. So it scales depending on the connectivity you have to the internet. And compatibility means it can run over any WAN technology because as you all know, we have lots of different WAN technologies and you can VPN over any of these different uh, WAN technologies. Here they are showing us that, you know, we can connect site to site or a mobile user in a coffee shop or someone that is working from home, which is a lot of people these days. And this slide is reinforcing that. So VPN is either site to site, uh, router to router, or you can have a remote user, whether they are at home or in a coffee shop, connecting to a site. An IPsec, and this is really the focus for what we are doing this week is IPsec. And we said IPsec is a framework. Framework. Uh, I like to use the uh, term, it's a buffet of many different protocols. It's not a single protocol like SSL or TLS. And uh, for example, you all know SSL has been deprecated and now TLS is the new king. Well, two, three years from now, there will probably be a newer protocol that is better than TLS. And then we will deprecate TLS and start using the newer protocols. And this is not going to be the case for IPsec for a long time to come because as new protocols become available, they become available to the IPsec framework. So IPsec will scale uh, over time to support newer protocols. Uh, so when we talk about the IPsec framework, we're talking about the IPsec protocols, AH for authenticated header. Is this the only thing you want to do just to authenticate the header and say, yep, it did come from this trusted party, which of course isn't nearly enough because you're still going over the public internet and ESP is for encrypting the payload and we most certainly want to encrypt the payload and that is a separate IPsec protocol, or you may want to do both, which is quite common. You want to authenticate the header 
and you want to encrypt the payload. And then the familiar terms, the terms we went over last week, confidentiality, integrity, authentication, confidentiality is encryption, and uh, IPsec supports four different uh, encryption protocols, and they will add more over time. And for integrity, we support MD5 and SHA. And please remember when we talk SHA, we're talking one, two, and three. Uh, and two and three have several different flavors. So we're talking about many different ways of ensuring integrity. Authentication, either pre-shared key or RSA. And whenever you see this acronym RSA, it is digital certificate. So we can use a digital certificate for authentication. And we said we don't really want to use that private public key for encryption. They are too big. They eat up too much resources. We want to agree on a symmetric key and use a symmetric key for encryption. And this is what DH does. DH either you know uniquely creates the same key at both ends securely, or it exchanges the key over the public internet securely, which we're familiar with from TLS and SSL. So this is the IPsec framework. And as you can see, we have lots of options. And the reason we have a blank square under AH is because if all you wanna do is authenticate header, then we're not going to be using confidentiality. Confidentiality is encrypting the payload. And if that's all you want to do, if you wanna do ESP, then of course we have to do confidentiality. Even if you don't want to do confidentiality, you still have to do integrity authentication and the edge. Um, but like I said, you know, it would be unusual for anyone uh, to create an IPsec tunnel and not encrypt. Uh, anytime you go over the public internet, by default, you want to encrypt. So any questions about the framework? Because this is really a great place to start. And a good slide to internalize. OK, moving on. So I'm going to fly over the next few slides. OK, confidentiality. Yep, you know, that is encryption. So we encrypt. And it's telling us that uh, IPsec supports DES, 3DES, AES, and SEL. And we're going to be focusing on AES, Advanced Encryption System. Integrity is hashing, OK? And we know it supports uh, MD5 and SHA1, 2, and 3, OK? Authentication, either by using a pre-shared key or RSA. And if we're using a pre-shared key, which is basically an agreed upon password that is configured at both end. Then we take the message and we add the pre-shared key to the message and we hash and then we send the hash uh, code over and then the receiving party will take the message, add the key, the pre-shared key, hash, and then compare those two values to each other. And if we're using RSA, then we're using the private and the public key. So we, we hash with the private key and then we decrypt with the public key, and then we do the opposite from the other side. And Defi Hellman is all about securely exchanging the uh, secret key. It's all about securely exchanging the symmetric key that we're going to be using for encrypting the payload. Protocol, I mentioned this before, uh, IPsec, you have a choice. Do you only want to do authenticate, uh, authenticate the header? Do you only want to encrypt the payload or do you want to do both? And you will see when we do the lab, you have these choices. And almost always people go with ESP plus AH, which makes sense. So if you're using AH, we don't encrypt. This is all they are telling us here, but you still need integrity, authentication, and DH. And authentication, we're using hashing for authentication. So it, remember uh, HMAC, everybody, MAC, message authentication code. And HMAC is for hashing message authentication code. And we said we get two benefits. We get integrity and we get uh, authentication. And this is exactly what we're doing here. So we take the IP header, the data, and then we add the pre-shared key. And then we hash the whole thing send it over, and then they take the uh, IP header, the data, the key, 
and then they hash it and then they compare the two hashed by just to each other. And that accomplishes two goals, not only integrity, but authentication as well. ESP is encryption. We're encrypting the payload and we have choices and nobody uses DES anymore. Three DES isn't terribly popular. AES is very good. So AES, you can do 128-bit or 256-bit encryption. And you can see the remaining IPsec options. So ESP encrypts and authenticates. So not only do we want to encrypt, we want to authenticate the other side of the connection. So, and then we encapsulate. So we take the original, and I will show you this in Packet Tracer, you take the original packet and then you encapsulate it into a new packet. Remember you have uh, computer A talking to computer B and computer A and computer B are using each other IPs. And then we get to the routers where the VPN is established and then we take that packet that was generated by computer A or computer B and we encapsulate it and we send it over to the other router and then we de-encapsulate. And that is something that happens often in networking, encapsulating and de-encapsulating uh, uh, packets. Okay. We do have two different ways of establishing the tunnel. Uh, it's one method for a user working from a coffee shop or from home, and it's a, a different method if it's site to site. So if it's site to site, you know, it's two routers. And ASA devices are often used for that purpose, just to connect site A to site B and site A to site C and D and so on. And that is on all the time, seven by 24. And then if you have a home user, they install a piece of software on their uh, PC. And then when they want to establish an IPsec uh, VPN tunnel, you know, they run it it does its thing, and then when you're done, you terminate. So you don't really need a, a router at home. You can, uh, but that's not how most people do it. They just install the software on their PC and then they go from there. And on Tuesday, I showed you it's built into the Windows platform. I can show you again today. And a lot of the vendors have their own software. For example, Cisco has a product called uh, AnyConnect and you install this small piece of software on your PC, and then you would use it to establish an IPsec-based uh, VPN tunnel. Very good. And then we talked about IKE, and I will show you a better slide, and this is a review, everybody, and I want to review this, and this is for internet key exchange. And this is really what we're using to establish the IPsec. And we said it's a two-step process. First, we establish the ISEC camp pipe, and then after that, we establish the IPsec pipe inside of it. So we're really creating two logical pipes. We're creating the ISEC camp pipe, and then we're creating the IPsec uh, pipe where we are doing the encryption. And then we have to agree on parameters. So you have site A, site B, you have user uh, Steve and site B, and they wanna create an IPsec tunnel well, there's a bunch of parameters we have to agree on. And the parameters are the stuff we've been talking about before. Do you want uh, header authentication or header authentication and payroll encryption? If you want confidentiality, exactly which protocol do you wanna use? What do you wanna use for integrity? What do you wanna use for authentication? And which DH group do you want to use? So we have to agree on this because we can't be using one on one side and a different one on the other side. It's not gonna work. And this is what phase one does. It says, okay, you know, we have the same parameters on both ends of this tunnel. So this is what's called phase one and phase two, and we're talking IKE, internet um, key exchange, phase one and phase two. And phase one, we're creating the ISA camp and we're agreeing on the parameters. The policy number has a local significance, so it doesn't have to be the same on each end. It can be 10 on one and 15 on the other, but the stuff inside has to be the same. So we're using AES for encryption, we're using SHA for 
integrity. And when you see SHA without anything afterward, it's SHA1. We're using pre-shared key. We're using VH14. And lifetime is how long do you want to go on until you renegotiate the keys for security purposes. You don't really want to use the keys for too long of a time because they may get compromised over time. And you want to keep renewing and changing those keys. And then we do the DH key exchange and we verify both ends of the tunnel. And then we start the IPsec uh, process of creating the IPsec pipe between the two ends. So this is phase one and phase two. And SA is for security association. This is what you have to create between the two ends, between the two routers, between the home user, the coffee shop user, and the site. You have to negotiate and agree on a security association between the two ends. And now they are showing us, you know, the exchange. And I think I want to stop here. Okay, except I do want to go over this really quickly because you will see this again. Configuration tasks, configure the ISA camp policy for IKE phase one. This is to establish the ISA camp pipe. And then configure the IPsec policy for IKE phase two. This is to create the IPsec pipe. And then configure the crypto map. So we have to map a policy, okay, to what we want to do and then apply the policy to an interface and then make sure it's working. So we have to test it and make sure it's working and doing what we want. And over here, they are talking about the perimeters. So encrypt traffic with ASA 256 and SHA, which is SHA1, which is 160 bit hash digest. Authentication with pre-shared key. Uh, exchange keys with DH24. Uh, ISA camp tunnel life is one hour. So at the end of each hour, we will renegotiate a new set of keys for ISA camp. And then the IPsec tunnel, okay, is 15 minutes lifetime, which is every 15 minutes renegotiate a new set of keys for the, ex for the encryption. And you will see this and then lots of details over here. And I think we would be good to go to the labs. So any questions before we dive into the three labs we have today? All right, then let's do it. So let's do the first lab, which we did uh, on Tuesday. And I want to do again today. And I want to take my time because it's really important that you understand uh, IPsec. And if you understand lab one, then the rest of it is a piece of cake. And if you don't understand lab one, then the rest of it is going to be in Greek. Okay. So I modified the lab a little bit. So we have two subnets, okay, and they are connected to two routers. And we want to create a tunnel between router two and router three, and we're going over the internet. So over here, I'm saying I'm emulating the internet. So we go through a bunch of routers, but we want to create a VPN between R2 and R3. And we want to use IPsec, and we want it to be secure. And this is a site-to-site. -site. Clearly, everybody, this is a site-to-site. -site. And PC0 and Server0 don't really know, nor do they really care. Okay, As far as PC0 is concerned, and as far as Server0 is concerned, there is no VPN. You know, they just talk to the router and the router routes the packet and it gets to its destination. Exactly what happens after that, they don't really care what, what does the router do. But we know we've created a VPN between R2 and R3. So a quick review before we get into the details. ISA camp, remember IKE, phase one, phase two. Internet Security Association and Key Management Protocol, it's pronounced ISACAMP, is used for negotiating, establishing, modification, and deletion of security association between the two ends of that tunnel. And the related perimeters, all the IPsec perimeters we talked about. It defines the procedure and packet format for peer authentication 
uh, creation and management of security associations and techniques for key generation. IKE, which is Internet Key Exchange, defines an automatic means of negotiating and authentication for IPsec security association. Okay. And IKE establishes the shared security policy and authenticated keys. Crypto map, you will see this term a little bit later on. A crypto map is a software configuration entity that performs two primary functions. Selects the data flow that needs security processing. Okay, so exactly what do you want to allow over that VPN pipe? And defines the policy for these flows and the crypto peer to which that traffic needs to go. And then before we start, okay, and I'm not going to do this today again, but basically R2 can communicate with R3, but PC0 cannot communicate with server zero because we don't have that pipe yet. So if I was to go to server zero and I was to do ping minus T, and I'm going to ping server zero at the other end, 172.16.22, and it's going to fail. However, if I was to go to R2 and ping R3, we do have a connection. Because if you cannot connect to the other router, how are you going to establish a VPN, right, everybody? So the clients don't have to be able to communicate with each other before we have a pipe. But the routers better be able to communicate or we wouldn't be able to establish a pipe. So ping, and that would be 200. One, two, two. And it's going to fail a couple of times. And then it's going to work. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, here we go. So it's working. So R2 can talk to R3, which is good. PC0 cannot talk to server zero because, you know, the, the routers aren't configured. Uh, for those subnets until we have a VPN connection between router two and router three. Okay. And then in order for site to site IPsec VPN to be established, one must have interesting data. So the pipe doesn't actually get established. We have all the perimeters, we have everything in place, but it doesn't happen until we have data that needs to flow over that VPN and that's called interesting data. And we already have interesting data because we did ping minus T and this ping is gonna keep failing until we have a tunnel established and then it's gonna start working. So let's look at IPsec settings, everybody. And if you have questions, please ask. Uh, and let me show you a couple more things before, okay. So these are the tasks that we have to do. Okay, uh, pre-task accept EULA and user license agreement. This is basically for the security package because we need to use the crypto command. The crypto command is not in the basic iOS operating system. It's a part of the security K9 module package and it's already enabled. But you have to remember that or when you type crypto, you're gonna get an error message. And then we're gonna do phase one. And then this task one is phase one, task two is phase two, task three is the ACL. What data do you want to allow over that VPN? Do you want to allow everything or do you want to restrict it? And you can use an ACL for that. If you want to allow everything, it's easy, permit, IP, any, any, you're done. If you want to restrict it, then this is your opportunity to restrict what flows over that tunnel. Okay. And then the crypto map, I'm sure you remember the crypto map. So we need to do this and attach it to an interface to say this is the interface we're going to use to establish the IPsec. And then we, we apply it and then we verify the tunnel is working. So this is when, and this is what we do in IKE phase one. And remember phase one is to establish the ISEC camp pipe. Phase two is to establish the IPsec pipe. And it is a lot of detail. It is a lot of detail, but this is detail you need to get your brain and your arms around. So we have main mode and aggressive mode. Main mode means protect everything, including your partner, the other side of the conversation. Aggressive mode means I'm not going to try and protect my uh, partner 
uh, from the other side of the conversation, meaning you know the IP information for your partner will be exposed, and that will shave you know half a second from the uh, tunnel establishing time. Very good. So IPsec peer authenticate each other. These are the different options we talked about. Negotiate matching IKE SA policy. We talked about the policy, policy 10, policy 15, basically the IPsec parameters we have to agree on. And then we have to use DF to securely exchange the symmetric key we're gonna use for encryption. And then we set up the tunnel, the ISECAMP tunnel, and now we can move ahead to phase two, which is the IP sector. And this is what we do in phase two, and it's only one mode, quick mode. We negotiate the IPsec security association. We establish the IPsec security association and keys inbound and outbound. And remember that lifetime, we renew those keys every uh, so many minutes or hours. Uh, maximum of one day. And optionally perform an additional Duffy Hellman exchange. So basically, if we discover that there is a, a quick mode attack going on, and a quick mode is a replay protection, basically, someone can capture a few packets and then they can replay them. And IPsec will know because IPsec numbers every packet. And if they see the same packet number again, you know, they're going to suspect foul play. And they say, you know, okay, we better renegotiate the keys. And that is an option. And this is the perfect forward secrecy. So if you were to enable PFS, basically you're saying, okay, throw away the keys and let's negotiate the new keys just to be safe. So the quick mode will reject a replay. So quick mode, meaning if someone was to capture packets and try to reuse those packets, IPsec is going to say, uh uh, I'm not accepting those packets again. I already processed that number. And if you want, you can enable PFS to negotiate a new set of keys for security purposes and pay a second or two uh, in, in tax for it because it's going to take a little bit of time to negotiate a new keys. So let's keep these in mind and let's go over this file. And I match the tasks to these tasks over here, everybody. So task one, two, three, four, five. And then when you're reading the file, you will see task one, it's the same task. So task one, configure the ISACAM policy parameters for IKE phase one. I'm spelling it out for you. Okay, so crypto, this is the command you will need the security K9 module for. So we're, we're creating a policy and we're giving it a number of 10. You can give it any number you want. It only has a local significance because you're using it locally for the uh, configuration on this router. And then we're using encryption AES-256, Advanced Encryption Services 256-bit key. For hashing, we're using SHA, which is SHA-1, which is 160-bit key. We're using a pre-shared key, PSK, pre-shared key, not RSA. And for DH, we're using group five. The longer, the bigger the, uh, the DH number is, the longer the key can be. So there's a direct correlation between the DH number and how secure that symmetric key is. And uh, group five is, fairly small number these days, but this is the largest number uh, the packet tracer supports. And lifetime, 3600, it basically means let's renegotiate the ISACAMP security association keys after one hour, which is pretty good. That, that is a good number for ISACAMP. Okay, and then we have to agree on the pre-shared keys and I'm calling it secret key. You can call it whatever you want. It's just a password. And this is my partner on the other side. So this is the IP address of the interface that I want to establish an IPsec pipe with. Okay. Task two. So this is task one, everybody. These are the parameters and they better be exactly the same on both ends. 
If they're not exactly the same, it may work, but you're gonna have some issues. So it's always wise to make sure that they're exactly the same at both ends. So let's move down. Okay, task two, configure IPsec policy parameters for IKE phase two. So the mode we're using is tunnel, which is the default mode. The other mode is transport for a PC. If you want to establish an IPsec from a computer, it will be a transport mode. Uh, if you want to establish a tunnel between two routers, it will be a, a tunnel mode. Okay. And here I'm saying we're using AH and ESP. If you remember, those are the IPsec protocols. And let me see, R2 to R3 is just a name. You can name it whatever you want. And AH, MD5, HMAC. AH is authenticate the header. We're using MD5. Uh, for hashing, and we're using HMAC for authentication. And I hope this makes sense. And then we're using encryption. ESP is encrypt the payload, and we are going to encrypt using AES protocol 256 bit key. And if you remember, ESP also authenticates. So for authenticating the ESP part, we're using SHA instead of MD5 and we're using HMAC. So this is what this long sentence means. And then we configure the access list and basically I'm allowing any traffic IP, permit IP between these two subnets. So there are no restriction, but it's not gonna carry data for any other subnet. It's only gonna carry data for those two subnets and that's all we have in here, okay. And then configure task four is configure a crypto map. Okay. And I'm explaining what PFS is perfect forward secrecy. It's an optional and extra security and defends against replay attacks and enable a new keys to be generated each time there is a replay attack. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Better safe than sorry. So you will see PFS later on. And then the crypto map. Okay, I'm matching the ACL 101 from above. I'm matching the R2 to R3 from above, everybody. So I'm putting it all together. Okay, this is my peer. I am matching a group five. If you remember, we use group five up here. So I'm matching it and I'm enabling PFS. Okay, here it is. So this is how we enable PFS perfect uh, forward secrecy. Okay. And for the IPsec, I'm renegotiating every, I'm renegotiating the security association keys every 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. So every one hour, renegotiate the ISEC camp keys, every 15 minutes, renegotiate the IPsec keys. And that's good. You pay a small tax for it, but it's good because it gives you better security. And then I have to apply it. So I am matching it to interface FA00. This is the router interface on the outside and that's it. And then you do exactly the same from the other end. Of course, you have to change the IPs, etc. but it's exactly the same settings from the other end. And you wanna make sure it's exactly the same. So I wanna show you what the options are before I do anything. So I'm gonna to come to R2, EN, and crypto ISA camp policy one. Okay, encryption, and I wanna see what the options are. So packet tracer supports three DAS, DAS, and AES. So it doesn't support all four, it supports three of the four, which is pretty, pretty good for packet tracer. And then if I was to do AES question mark, it says I support 128 bit, 192 bit and 256 bit. And then I'm gonna go with 256. So this is that. And then hash question mark, you can use MD5 or SHA. So I'm gonna use SHA because it's a longer key. And then authentication, 
Remember, it's either pre-shared or RSA, and Packet Tracer only supports pre-shared. It doesn't support digital certificates, so we don't really have much of a choice here. Okay, and then lifetime, question mark, 60 seconds. So basically every one minute up to 86,400 seconds, which is 24 hours. So the smallest number you can use is one minute and the largest number you can use is 24 hours. Remember site to site, you know, they're up and running seven by 24. So it's running all the time and you were saying, okay, if you don't, if you don't set a lifetime or if you want to set a lifetime, you know, you can't have that number be more than one day. So worst case scenario, every day, we're gonna renegotiate the keys. And a day is too long because it gives a hacker too long of a time to try and figure out what those keys are. And what most people do is a smaller number, maybe an hour, half an hour, 15 minutes. And yes, it's gonna take a second or two, uh, but people are willing to pay a tax for security these days. Okay, I'm just showing you what the options are. So quick question about the lifetime. Does it start from the moment you type the command or is there something within the Cisco um, I firmware think, that- I think it starts from the moment the pipe is established. Okay. So if you were to configure router one and router two and you don't have interesting data for 15 minutes, nothing, ha the counter doesn't start until you know the pipe is established. So just to show you, you know, PC zero is still pinging and failing because we don't have a pipe yet. So I want to show you a few more options. Okay, so exit crypto uh, IPsec transform set uh, R2 to R3 is a name. You can call it what you want, layer two to layer two. You see this very often. And now let's see what the options. And this is what Packet Tracer supports. If this was a real router, you will see a longer list. And it basically says for AH, for authenticating the header, I support MD5 and SHA and HMAC. And for ESP, this is what I support. You can encrypt with DES, 3DES, or AES. And then for authentication, ESP authentication, I support ESP, MD5, HMAC, or SHA, HMAC. And I hope by now it's very, very clear in everyone's head what is the difference between ESP 3 des and what is the difference between ESP MD5 HMAC. So the first three are for encryption and the last two are for authentication. So we want to encrypt and we want to authenticate. And authenticating header, we're just authenticating. And that's why we're using HMAC, because all we want to do is authenticate. This packet came from my trusted partner, nobody else. Questions? It's a lot. And I think if you go over those slides a few times, everybody, or keep them available, and then if you were to redo this lab a few times and go through it slowly and make sure you understand what every line is, like I just explained to you, it will begin to make sense. I had a question about a, a PFS. Yes. Um, with replay attacks and it having to renegotiate the yep. uh, ICAMP link, everything, um, is that a potential attack vector if someone's able to like isolate where a VPN traffic is originating uh, replaying their traffic over and over again, forcing them to renegotiate um, all yes, their keys yes, and their connection? Yes, yes, yep, yep, yep. I, I, I see where you're going, Joey. I was lost for a minute, but I got it. Yes, it can be like a denial of service attack, right? So that's what denial of service, basically you're denying someone from uh, providing the service they want to provide. And if I heard you correctly, someone can capture a few packets and then they can keep replaying them. And each time they replay them, it's gonna force the routers to re renegotiate the security association keys. And yep, and while they are renegotiating, 
renegotiating the keys, the service is down. Is that what you're saying, Joey? Yep. Yep. So absolutely, you are correct. But please remember, in 2020 and beyond, companies are more than happy to pay that price for security. And then they say, okay, you know, if we're being under attack, what can we do to defend ourselves from that attack? But, but they are willing to pay the downtime price just to ensure security. I don't think there is a CIO on planet Earth that's going to say, you know, no, 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 you know, we're willing to assume a risk. That would be the last decision they make as a CIO. But yeah, it, it can be a, uh, an attack vector and a denial of service attack vector. So let's copy and paste everybody. So just to be safe, I'm going to restart my lab, lab three. And remember, we need that interesting traffic. So I will redo my ping. And you can do the interesting traffic later on. You don't have to have interesting traffic. Just remember the uh, the tunnels are not going to be established until you have interesting traffic. Traffic. So let me come over here and start sending some interesting traffic. And of course, there's nothing interesting about ping data. It's just data. All right, and it's gonna fail. So let me copy and paste. And I'm, I'm quickly going to go over our three configuration, but you will see it is a copy of R2 with some minor changes. E, paste. And when we did the crypto map, it said this new crypto map will remain disabled until a peer and a valid access list has been configured. Okay, very good. And then show run. And these are all the configurations. This is the ACL. And this is the, the interface. And this is the crypto map. And this is all the information we configured. This is the IPsec information and this is the security association parameters we agreed to before okay and we're, we don't have any security association yet we will come back and do these commands show crypto isacamp sa okay but it's disabled it's not active yet uh, and then do the ipsec IPsec SA and no data is flowing yet, zero, zero. So let's look at R3, the other site, the other router. Okay, so crypto ISACAM policy 10, we can give this whatever number we want. It only has a, a local significance. However, the parameters better be the same. Everybody, the, bet, the uh, parameters must be the same. So we're using encryption AS256. For hashing SHA, we're using a pre-shared key, group five, uh, same lifetime. The lifetime can be different, uh, but then you're creating more work for yourself because now you have two clocks for the lifetime and either side can renegotiate the keys. Am I making sense, everybody? So if one says 15 minutes and one says 20 minutes, well, guess what? You're going to renegotiate every 15 and then, I guess, every 15. And then the other router will renegotiate five minutes later. Does that make sense, everybody? So when router says 15, when the router says 20, you hit the 15, you renegotiate, and then you hit 20, and then you renegotiate again. And then you hit 15, and you hit 20. So you're renegotiating twice uh, if the lifetime doesn't match between the two sides. And this is why you want everything to match. And here we're using the other side IP address. This is exactly the same. Okay, the IPsec um, protocols, we're using the same exact one. You can't have AH on one end and no AH on the other end. You can't do payload encryption on one end and no payload encryption in the other end. Okay, so common sense. 
Okay. So it's exactly the same, uh, only from R3 point of view. Minor, minor differences between the two. So you do one, you copy, paste, and you make a few tweaks. The N of T, paste. And now I have configured router two and router three. I can maximize, okay. For IPsec, I have interesting traffic going through. It may take a minute or so to establish the ISECAM pipe and then to reestablish the IPsec pipe within that. So let me speed it up a little bit or we can just sit back and let it do its thing. So let's just speed it up a little bit. Everybody, it's pinging. Did you see? Uh, let me, it wasn't pinging and then it started pinging. So now we have a pipe. We have a VPN and I can use it for, remember, permit IP. So I can go to PC1 and I can FTP. So instead of the ping, I can FTP. That should work. Do I have FTP enabled? Services FTP. FTP is on. Let me try something different. HTTP 172.16.202. I'll have to go back and take a look at the uh, at the ACL. Okay. But ping is definitely working. So forgive me for that, everybody. Let's see. I will fix it. Remember, we're dealing with packet tracer and all of the packet tracer issues. So why did it stop? Weird. Give me a second. So let me do R3 and then redo R2. So R3. R2, and I guarantee you these are good configurations. R2, and let's send some interesting traffic. Minus T17.16. Two. How about pink and fast forward? We didn't do anything different. Stay with me, we will fix it. is R1, R2. And R3. Okay, we're working. So let's come back and take a look at what's happening here. And now if I was to do show crypto ISA camp security association, 
And you can see we do have a security association between these two ends, the source and the destination, and it's active. And there are a couple of other options in here. Show the policy. If you want, you can see the ISACAM policy. And these are the default policies. No, not policy 10. Everybody here we are. So this is policy 10. This is what we agreed to in our configuration. And then if we want, we can see the IPsec pipe within. So instead of ISACAMP, IPsec Security Association, and you can see data is flowing, okay, between these two routers, okay. And what's the other option here? And we can do the transform set. And this is the transform set that we created R2 to R3 and then from R3 point of view, it's R3 to R2. Just, you know, turned it around. But let me show you what happens if we were to do a trace route from PC0, everybody. We want to do a trace route. Okay. So the trace route is not going to show you all the internet routers because we created a tunnel from R2 to R3. So let's come back to PC0 and let's do a trace route. Trace route. And of course we go through 172.161. It's over here. And then it's not gonna show me what's happening in between. And then magically it's gonna show me the other side of the VPN. Everybody? And if I had 15 routers in between, I have two, but if I had 15 routers in between, you wouldn't be able to see any of them. Because as far as the endpoints are concerned, you know, I'm going straight from this router to this other router. I'm tunneling. So in this scenario, the end devices don't know, don't care. So if you're working on site A and you're talking to devices on site B, C, and D, and you have VPN connections, you don't really care. However, you know, once you get to your router that connects you to these other sites, it VPNs into either a corporate office or directly to the other site. So it can be a, a hub model or it can be a partial mesh or a full mesh model, whatever makes sense to you. So when I work for Hewlett Packard, Hewlett Packard operates in 160 different countries and creating a full mesh is impossible. So what we did is we had a connection to corporate and then we had connections to the sites we did a lot of business with. So Corvella site was a printer business so, and so is Boise, and so is San Diego, and so is Vancouver, Washington. And we had VPN tunnels to each of those sites because we didn't want to have to go through corporate to get to our uh, sister sites. But then for everyone else, we will go through corporate. We wanted to talk to uh, Colorado, uh, Massachusetts, we will go through corporate for that because creating a VPN between each of these 600 different sites is impossible and very costly. So what's left here in this lab? That's, that's pretty much it. Okay. Any questions here? A lot of options, a lot of perimeters, just an awful lot of perimeters. Uh, and I hope they make sense. If not, please ask. So let's go back to R2. And tell me if any of these lines don't make sense. Any one of those lines don't make sense. And we can talk about it. No, nope. they all make sense or it's too early. No, that makes sense. I mean, we talked about the different ones that we have available to us. Yep. So I think like if if you didn't know the whether you needed you know which authentication which encryption that you're going to use and you just yes. saw those 
abbreviations or the you know hash sha then yeah it would be like yes. you said at the beginning yep. but no they, they make sense okay very good i hope by now they do make sense because we've been talking a lot about encryption and hashing uh, and the difference between the different uh, encryption protocols hashing protocols the difference between different keys aas supports 128 192 256 and you have to make that decision and you make the decision based on the data. How sensitive is the data? Because 256 is a much longer key than 128, and you're paying a tax for that. So on one hand, the communication is going to be slower. On the other hand, it's going to be safer. And you have to find that balance. And I, I don't know what that balance is. It depends on the kind of data you're sending over that tunnel. So if it's very sensitive data, 256 makes more sense. If it's not super sensitive, 128 is good enough. And good enough is a term that the industry uses a lot because they know they can do better, but this is good enough. This is good enough. We don't really need to do more. This is good enough. We're good. So you have the labs and I would say, you know, go over it go over each and every line and if any one line doesn't make sense whichever line doesn't make sense let me know but make sure you understand what each line does because each line has a purpose has a purpose so there's nothing random in here there are a few optional things the pfs is optional so you can remove it it wouldn't make any difference unless there is a a replay attack and even if there's a, a replay attack remember the router will discard those packets because it has already processed those numbers. It's saying, you know, I'm at number 10,512. This is 752. I, I'm not going to bother with it. I'm going to discard it. Uh, but if you're concerned that you may be under attack, then you would use the PFS to negotiate new set of keys. But it's optional. It's not required. It's optional. Uh, the rest of it is required. So I want to come back here for a second, everybody. This line right here. Okay, the IPsec protocols. So you don't have to do AH and ESP. You can just do AH or you can just do ESP. Um, and then remember, you know, you know, what data are you sending over and how secure do you want it to be? Not using ESP doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't understand why anybody wouldn't want to encrypt data that is going over the public internet. It just doesn't make any sense. You can use a weaker key. You can say, I'm not going to use a 256. Uh, I'm going to use 128. You can say, I'm going to use DES 56 bit, but you still want to encrypt. And then the level of encryption depends on the kind of data you're sending over the pipe. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's do the next lab. And let me make a note to myself. I need to fix something. All right, so let's do the next one. The next one is remote. Remember, it's either site to site or remote to a site. Site to site is what you have between offices. Okay, small, medium, large offices. You want a site to site connection and it's on all the time. Uh, if you're a remote user working from a coffee shop or from home, you don't really need a router at home just to create a seven by 24 VPN. I mean, you can, and some people do, but it's just too costly. And if you have you know, 10,000 people working remotely, it's just too much overhead. And you don't really need that connection up and running all the time. You're not working seven by 24 from home. So you work for you know, eight, 10 hours, then you establish the connection for eight, 10 hours, and then you uh, disconnect when you're done. So let's do the next one. And I've said before, you know, the last few years I worked for Hewlett Packard, I worked from this office and uh, we were using any connect from Cisco. And every morning or whenever I started work, I would, uh, VPN, and when I'm done, I will uh, terminate the connection. 
So here we have PC1, PC2, and this is the site. So pretend over here, those servers, this is your site. And pretend this is a simple lab, everybody. And this R is, you know, your connection to the internet and to the site. And this is your home office. And you want to VPN from your home office into your site. So you can use the resources inside your site. And I will show you what happens to the IP address. So when you VPN from a computer, you get a new IP address. Site to site, your IP doesn't change. You don't know there's a VPN. You don't care. You know, for you, it's site to site. As an end user, it's completely uh, transparent, completely um, uh, unaware of what's happening. But if you're VPNing from your PC, things will be different. So let's do it. So R1, the, the one and only router we have here. Okay, so we're gonna configure AA and we're using authent list one, okay, for everything. So we created an AA authentication and authorization. And this is the, the name. This is the handle, authent list one. And then we created a local account called admin. Very good, nothing here. And now we get to configure ISACAMP policy parameters for IKE phase one. Looks familiar, everybody. And we have a policy 10, call it what you want. Encryption AS, I didn't specify. So it's gonna default hash SHA, pre-shared key, uh, HD group five, and renegotiate after 24 hours, which is too big of a number, but it's a sandbox. So there's nothing new here, right, everybody? This is exactly what we saw before. And let me do one thing here. Yeah. Version. Okay. And we have we have the crypto module installed. And then phase two, everyone. And look what this says over here. Okay. Only using ESP IPsec protocol. Remember AH. ESP, and in this example, I'm just using ESP. I'm not authenticating the header. I'm only encrypting and authenticating the payload. So I'm just using one of the two IPsec protocols, and that's a choice. And this is what you see here. So there's no AH. ESP AES for encryption, I didn't specify 256, so it defaults, probably the defaults to 128. And then I'm using SHA HMAC for authentication. Okay. I put this reverse route in here intentionally, not that we need it, not that it's doing anything for us, but I wanted to explain it just in case you come across it. Just in case, you know, you get a job and you're looking at the configuration and you see a reverse route and you say, gee, you know, we didn't go over that. I, I, I put it in here with an explanation and you can comment it out. It's not gonna make any difference in this scenario. Okay. And then remember when you are tunneling from a PC, you're going to get an IP from your remote subnet. So you VPN into your network Well, you're VPNing into a local area network. And it's gonna give your PC an IP from the site local area network. So at home you have whatever IP you have, you VPN and you will get a new IP. And as far as the network is concerned, from that point on your device is inside your enterprise. You're in the other side of the firewall. Okay, and that is the, the beauty of VPNing from a device, is you bypass all the security and you, know, you land on the other side of the firewall and it gives you a local IP. And now as far as the rest of the devices are concerned, you know, you're on site, you're working from on site. So this is the pool, so we need a pool because you need an IP from inside your site. And then configure the ISACAMP for the client because the client has to be authenticated and log on, okay? 
and we're using uh, the group Cisco. The key is Cisco123. You will see this when we run the client from the PC. Okay. The crypto map, and then we apply it to an interface and we end. So it's not exactly the same as we saw before. Some parts of it are. Uh, IKE phase one and IKE phase two are the same. But this is a client. This is not site to site. So the configurations are different for a client. So let's copy and paste and then see what we did. So here we are. We're pasting the IPsec configuration on router one. And then from the PC, let's start with PC one. There's a VPN client. Okay, and we have a VPN client inside Windows. I'm going to show you, and we can go there if you want and take a closer look. You see, network internet VPN, VPN, add VPN. Okay, it's built into Windows. I don't think it's a very popular, I mean, you and I, if we want to experiment, this is the tool we will use to experiment. I think most enterprises go with a third party VPN product like Cisco has one called uh, uh, AnyConnect that I, I used for quite a few years inside uh, HP. But Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, they all have a VPN client built in. And uh, the one thing I wanna show you is built in. Okay, and these are your protocol options. And we did this in Tuesday and you can see IPsec, IPsec and IKE version two is IPsec. And IPsec is the gold standard today for remote connectivity. IPsec was designed for IPv6. It's built into IPv6 and it's available for V4. Clearly we were using it for V4 before and it is the gold standard and it will continue to be the gold standard because it's a framework. It's not a single protocol, it's a framework. And they can add and remove protocols as they become available. Okay, so let's run the VPN client. And the group name, if you remember, it was Cisco. The key is Cisco 123. And then we need the host IP, which is right here. And this is 10, 10, 10, 1. And then we need to authenticate the user and you can authenticate the user many ways, single factor, multi-factor, digital certificate. So here we're just using an account and a password, admin and admin one, two, three and connect. VPN is connected and this is my new IP. Everybody, 192.168.110. And I wanna show you where that came from. And do you see this pool? So it grabbed the first available IP from the pool. And if I was to do the same thing from PC2, which I can, let me try it, and I should get 11. Cisco, Cisco123, 10, 10, 10, 1, admin, admin, 1, 2, 3. Is this all correct? Yep, connect, VPN 11. Good, everybody. So it's just a pool of IPs that are made available specifically for people that are tunneling in and the device gets an IP from that pool. All right, so what can I do now? Okay, I did. So let me see if I can ping 172 because now I'm inside. Okay, this enterprise and ping 172.16.110. And it's working because as far as they're concerned, I'm local, local to the site and I can do whatever I can do from inside the site. 
okay and now i can do the opposite i can go to other devices on site and ping that pc using that ip address ping Ten one nine two one six eight one ten, and it's working both ways. Remember, you know, I'm behind the firewall. I am on site, and I can do anything I could do if my PC was connected to a switch on site. Okay. And then I did the same thing and I can test it from here as well. And I can use the services. So if I wanted to FTP, okay, I can use DNS. Let's see what do we have in this table, DNS, Zico. So I can do NS lookup Zico. Okay, so it wasn't fully defined here so it's working i can go to a web i am on site that's the message i want to say to you 172.16.1.11 and it's working and file server ftp to 172.16.1.10 and ftp is working so this is connecting from remote PC. And you can do all of this with your home devices. You can configure your Windows device to be a VPN host, a VPN server, and then you can configure another device to be a VPN client, and then you can tunnel. The problem you're going to have is everything is in the same subnet. So uh, good luck with that, because supposedly your home in a different subnet and you're VPNing into the site, which is a different subnet. And the challenge you're gonna have from home is everything on the same subnet. If you really wanna experiment, I would enable the VPN server on a home device. I would configure the firewall to enable the port forwarding for that service. And then I would go to some other local area network, a coffee shop, a friend's house, and I will VPN from there. I think that would be a really, really good lab. But to do it all inside your home, uh, it's not going to work because all the devices are already in the same subnet. But you can certainly experiment. Any questions on this lab? So if you understand IPsec, you know, you understood IPsec. And we selected different choices here, but those are the perimeter choices we made. We didn't want to do it, we didn't want to do a edge. And uh, we used a smaller AES key, the default key, which I believe is 128. Okay, let's do the last lab. So this is number five. They are really, these are two excellent videos. I hope you're watching all the videos that are built into Net Academy. Um, I strongly recommend that you watch these videos and they are inside the chapter eight Net Academy material. And you may wanna watch them before you do the labs. So let's do five. There's nothing new about five, except we're going over a frame relay. So if you remember one of the slides said, let me find the slide for you. Right here, you see this compatibility? This is what I wanna talk about. So cost saving is straightforward security, lots and lots of security features we've been talking about it all the different security perimeters scalability is how big of a pipe do you have the ipsec pipe is going to be based on the pipe the two ends have so if one has 
a terabyte and one has 10 megabit, well, it's going to be a small pipe. If both ends have a terabyte, it's going to be a big pipe. And compatibility means it works over any WAN uh, architecture, uh, frame relay, Sonnet, ATM, Metro Ethernet, you name it. Okay, uh, IPsec will work over all of these IP based architectures. And we're testing frame relay. So this is side to side frame relay. This is the frame relay over here, everybody. This is frame relay. And what I want to do is I want a VPN from R3 to R4 going over a frame relay. Okay. So this is a refresher. Okay. IKE phase one. This number local significance. AES encryption 256. SHA1 160 bit key for hashing. Pre shared PSK is the only thing that Packet Tracer supports. The other option is RSA, which is a digital certificate. Group 5 is the largest DH group Packet Tracer supports. And this is how often in seconds I want to renegotiate the uh, security association keys. This is the secret key, call it what you want. This is my partner in crime. Okay. And I'm not using a H, right everybody? You see it? So again, I'm encrypting the payload. I'm authenticating the payload. I'm not authenticating the header. I'm not authenticating the header. There's no a H, which is what we did in the previous lab. And if we wanted to, we could. Okay, if I was to type this command with a question mark, it's gonna say, yep, you know, you could do that. And this is my ACL. And then the crypto map, and then I'm applying it. It's almost exactly the same, right, everybody? It's almost exactly the same. And this is what I am saying here before you start, compare the R3 config to what we did in the previous lab. And if you just give me one minute, I'd like to do that. So we know there's one change right here. Okay, so you can look at these guys. They're exactly the same. Okay, and then down below here, and this is phase two. So let's go to phase two. And there's a, a difference here. In the previous lab, we were using a H, and in this lab, we're not using a H. But we could add it, and then it would be almost exactly the same. So let's do it. So this is R3. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, we need interesting traffic, but we will do the interesting traffic later on. And then let's configure R4. And please remember they better match. Okay. If they don't match, you're going to have some issues, or it may not establish the tunnel depending on how big the difference is. Uh, but always go with they're going to be exactly the same. The parameters are going to be exactly the same at each end. And this is R4. Yep. And let's send some interesting traffic. Let's ping 222113. And we can sit here and let it fail for a minute or two, or we can speed it up. So let's speed it up here. Actually, it didn't take very long. Did you guys see? It failed twice and then it worked. And now if I was to come over here, type show crypto ISA camp security association, it's active, it's alive, 
source and destination. And if I was to do IPsec, security association, and data is flowing. And let me try, yeah, I don't have any servers here. Okay, I will have to fix this as well to enable FTP, HTTP, etc. But it, it's working. The tunnel was established and the tunnel is working. And it's working over frame relay. And in fact, there is nothing in the IPsec configuration that talks about frame relay. So IPsec doesn't care. It says, you know, that's not my problem. You, you know, accommodate whatever WAN architecture you have separately. And once you can ping, once you can communicate with one another, router three and router four over whatever WAN architecture, good. Now I can do my job. So any questions on VPN for those of you that listened to Peter's talk yesterday, he, he talked about uh, VPNs quite a bit. This is the norm. This is how companies connect sites to one another. This is how remote users connect to their enterprises. And increasingly, this is how companies connect to their business partners. So you have a contract manufacturer and you're exchanging data, it's very easy just to establish a tunnel and then send data back and forth all day long. And everyone has a connection to the internet. There isn't a, a person on planet Earth that doesn't, a company that doesn't have a connection to the internet and you can use it for that purpose and for all other purposes you use it for. So I wanna tell you, one relevant story from my uh, work experience, but I want to answer your questions first. Do you have any question about anything we did? Other than it has a lot of details and it's going to take us some time to get our brains around it. And start with Net Academy. That's really where you want to start. And then move on and redo the labs we did together. And if it all makes sense, then you know, you have all the skills you need after that to do whatever you need to do. One of the questions I have, and I think it's, I may have asked this like with Parker, but I can't remember. I, I get the concepts and I get the commands, but how, how important is it that I, I memorize all the commands and everything? Yeah. Or is it just as long as I know what I need to do, where to look it up, is that, is that good enough? Yeah. Or should I, like in programming, if I don't know how to do a dynamic memory allocation, then I failed as a, a programmer. If I don't know, like the, you know, if I don't memorize these commands, have I, you know, not done myself justice? So, so this is my standard answer. And I talk about this often. You need to memorize for the certification exam. You're not going to walk into a certification exam with a reference book in hand or anything in hand, just empty, clean hands. So you have to memorize, you don't really have a choice. And I hate that because there's so much to memorize, but you have to memorize it for the certification exam. After that, please don't memorize anything. Look, this is all you need. If you have this file right here and you need to establish an IPsec VPN connection, you take it, you tweak it, and you're, you're good to go. So you have a template you have a file called IPsec template with all of your favorite IPsec settings. And then you copy it and you tweak it and that's what you do. And if you were to memorize that, you're, you're really wasting your brain cells. Uh, speaking for me, I don't have very many working brain cells left. So I hate memorizing anything that I don't need to memorize and I don't because I know I will fail miserably at it but I'm pretty good at documenting and I'm pretty good at finding those documents. And then I open up the document and it's like, yep, that's all I need. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. So for, for the certification, I'm sorry, you have to memorize. You don't really have a choice. And remember, uh, iOS has online help, just like we saw before. Okay. Crypto question mark, and then you type the next perimeter question mark, and then you type the next perimeter question mark, but you still have to memorize some stuff. 
but for your real life, don't. And then of course, you know, if you do it 50 times, you're gonna memorize it by, you know, the time you've, you've done it 50 times already. But starting, you know, you're, you're, especially if you haven't used IPsec in a while. Uh, so just put it in a file, a template. That's why what I like to call these files, put it in a template file and then just pull the, copy the template and tweak it. Any questions on VPN, IPsec, IKE phase one, IKE phase two? Interesting traffic is the term the industry uses. It's just traffic. It doesn't have to be interesting. It can be really boring. It's just needs some traffic to wake up. It's like hitting the on switch. You need traffic for the on switch. And then it goes on. IPsec is the gold standard. Like I showed you before, there are lots of protocols. Everybody, there are a lot of tunneling protocols. And this is only what Microsoft supports. That's not all of them. Okay. So there's a bunch of, uh, an L2TP is layer two, tunneling protocol. That's what L2TP is. So there's a bunch of, um, tunneling protocols and IPsec is the gold standard and will continue to be the gold standard for many years to come because of its flexibility. There's a newer encryption, a newer hashing, newer authentication, newer key exchange. They'll just throw it in there. So the last few years I worked for HP, I inherited a system called Virtual Factory. I worked for the inkjet business, which is a massive business, had 25,000 people, multi-billion dollar business inside HP. And I was responsible for bringing in the contract manufacturer data for the printing business. This is what the virtual factory is. And of course, you know, giving them access to some of our data as well. And our largest supplier is a European company called ST Microelectronic. And they had a US headquarter in Dallas. And we had data centers everywhere, including data centers in Houston. And we needed to pull this data fairly quickly because in some locations they will manufacture stuff in the morning and we're consuming it in the afternoon. And we needed the data before we can consume the materials they just manufactured in the morning. So it had to be up and running all the time. And time to manufacturing was sometimes two hours, three hours, they manufacture it two hours later, it's put into a product. And when I inherited the system, we had three T1 lines connecting the Houston uh, ST microelectronics site to the Hewlett Packard uh, Houston site. Three T1s. T1 is 1.544. Three times 1.544. We're talking, you know, less than five megabit per second. And it was HP was paying the bill, and it was about eighteen thousand dollar a month. Everybody, eighteen thousand dollar a month for less than five megabit per second connection. And you and I and everyone else has a much bigger pipe out of our cell phone these days, and we don't pay anything near 18,000. So a few months into my new role as this virtual factory manager, we started to run out of bandwidth and they wanted to add a fourth T1 line, which will bring the cost to $25,000 a month. And I said, this is nuts, this is crazy. Who the hell does this anymore? So we said, let's just um, VPN. Let's just, we had a, a terabit connection to the internet. They had a terabit connection to the internet. So we have these massive pipes into the internet. Let's just tunnel between the two sites. And without management blessing, all we were able to do is what's called a POC, a proof of concept. So I got a few people working on it and we proved it. We proved that, you know, we can turn the T1 lines off and we can just use a VPN between Hewlett Packard and ST Microelectronic. And it was a much bigger pipe because we had a much bigger pipe going into the internet from both ends. And that was around the time I left. And to turn it on, we needed management approval and I was leaving. So I told the person that I inherited the system from me, this is one thing you need to do. You know, you need to work through the management chain to get this approved. But we did the POC, we did the proof of concept. 
And I'm hoping they turned it on soon after I left and HP was saving $25,000 a month, you know, for what would have been a six megabit per second connection. So this is the difference between leased lines, $25,000 for six megabit, everybody, to you already have a connection to the internet and we're gonna use it for everything we use it for plus a VPN. So they didn't have, they didn't need a bigger pipe. They didn't need to do anything different. Everything we needed was in place. And we had, you know, routers at each end and the routers supported IPsec, easy enough. Let's just configure the routers to establish a VPN, send the data over the VPN and save $25,000 a month. And this is where the industry has been going. This is 2012 story. And even long time before that, that's where the industry was going, was beginning to turn off the legacy site to site, legacy home to site connections. And of course, like everyone else, we're going to the internet to do all of that stuff for a much reduced price. So in this slide, everybody in this slide, cost saving. Okay, that's a perfect example from $25,000 a month to we already pay for the one terabyte and we don't have to do anything we're already doing. So next week we will be talking about ASA, Adaptive Security Appliance. And guess what? One of the things people use an ASA for is VPN. So in some of the labs we will do next week, it will be an IPsec VPN using an ASA at each end. And some people have an ASA. Those are not very expensive devices. So if you really want to have one at your home, you can. And then instead of doing anything on your PC, you can just have a, the equivalent of a site to site, except the site is your home. But that's not a scalable solution. Even if it's $500, you know, and you have 10,000 people working from home, it just doesn't scale. But if you're a, a really important person, you're an executive vice president, then sure, they will gladly do it for you. So you wouldn't have to do anything on your PC. It's just there all the time. Questions? Are we good? Do you feel you have everything you need to move forward? I believe so. Okay. How about the rest of you? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, enjoy the long weekend, everybody. I know we have a Tuesday, Thursday class, so I will see you next Tuesday, but Monday is a holiday. So enjoy the long weekend, and I will see you in Tuesday to go over ASA. Have a great rest of the week. You too. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Have a good rest of the week, too. Thank you. Thank you. I can't Bye. speak English. <laughs> Bye.